Hey, I'm John Gordon with Positive University, and my guest today is Doug Conan. Doug is one of my most admired leaders that I've admired over the years. I've learned so much from him and his leadership. Years ago, I had the opportunity to speak to his company. He was the CEO of Campbell Soup, the Campbell Soup Company, and just learned so much from him and his leadership. And I want to just uh, bring you right in, Doug. Let's start talking about right away. I mean, when you took over as CEO of Campbell Soup, it was not doing that well at the time. Can you talk about that experience and what, was, what that was like? Well, I, 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 came from, I came to Campbell Soup from uh, working in Nabisco as president of Nabisco Foods, and I had gone in there right after Barbarians at the Gate. And uh, the world's largest LBO, an incredibly difficult, toxic culture, and I thought I'd seen everything. And then I got to Campbell Soup Company. And uh, it was a challenging situation. We had lost half our market value in one year, which it's hard to do for a food company. We were headquartered and are headquartered in the poorest, most dangerous city in the United States, Camden, New Jersey, where there are 75,000 people and 70 murders a year. Uh, we, uh, the, the, the city itself was bankrupt. And, uh, we were running a 20th century food company that the leading analyst uh, compared us to a buggy whip, uh, selling the same products we'd been selling 100 years earlier. Uh, so we were in difficult straits. I was recruited in, having had success turning around a company at Nabisco, and I jumped in with both feet and found it was a very difficult operating environment. Uh, Ultimately, we got it up and running. We, we had to reset the company, but then we had a good, a, a great 11 year run, created extraordinary value, and also created world-class uh, employee engagement at the same time. And as crazy as it seems, we became one of the top 100 places to work for IT professionals in a canned soup company in the United States, in Camden, New Jersey. So, uh, we had a great run. We had to make big changes though. I had to, in the first two and a half, three years, we turned over 300 of our top 350 leaders. I don't know of another Fortune 500 company that's ever had to go through that kind of change process, turning over six out of seven leaders. We had to recruit in about 150 people from outside. We were able to promote 150 people from inside but it was a massive change process, and uh, I had never done it before on that scale. So, you know, pardon my language, but I, as a CEO, I was a first-time CEO, and I, quite frankly, didn't know my ass from my elbow about certain things. Uh, and, uh, but I knew we had a change, and the last thing I'll say on this front is that as a leader, you basically have three years to get it right. I don't care whatever level you're in. The first year you go in, it's the other guy's fault. The second year, well, we're learning. The third year, you own it. And so if you're going to make change, if you need to make change, you need to do it and have a positive trajectory coming out of year three. So I, I've, read, or, yeah, I've written about you. I know the story really well. Can you expand on what happened in terms of the pessimism that was in the company, the managers you had to let go. You talked about 350 people. How did you decide who to let go and who needed to stay? Well, uh, it wasn't an overnight process. I think what you need to do in an organization is be very clear about your expectations. We set up very early on clear expectations about what we needed to do and how we expected our leaders to behave in doing it. So we created what I call the Campbell Leadership Model and said, here are our expectations of leaders. And then I don't think you can manage performance if you, you can't manage, manage it if you don't inspect it. So we started to, uh, we evaluated our leaders against the leadership model. And we also looked at how our leaders were doing in terms of engaging their people. And we started man measuring employee engagement every year. So I had two years worth of data points 
on most of, on many, many of these leaders before we started having serious discussions about whether they were the right fit for Campbell or not. We were very clear, you know, you need to lift your game on both on what you do and how you do it. And we're here to help you and we hope it works out. We want it to work. But if it doesn't, we're gonna to have to make a tough call either by putting you in a position that's different than the one you're in now or by letting you go. But work with us, we're gonna try and make this work. But we do have to, there's, we do have to turn around this company. As important as our top 350 leaders were, we had 19,650 people that worked in the company who were counting on them. And so there was a greater good there. And uh, interestingly, so we evaluated them in terms of their performance, both on the what and the how, and we gave them a couple years to hit stride. And interestingly, while we went through this process, as we began to let go people, our employee engagement, I was scared to death every year to see what the new numbers would be. Our employee engagement actually got better every year because those 19,650 employees knew we needed to make the change. They were just waiting to see if we had the gumption to do it. So, uh, in, in, you know, I took years off my leadership life uh, agonizing over this, as it should, because these are people's lives we were affecting. But uh, in, in hindsight, uh, we did what the organization felt we needed to do. I wish I'd known that at the time. I might have slept a, slept a little better. I did not sleep well for the first three years. Right, so through this process, you weren't sure how it was going to go, but then you look back and you see that you made the right decisions in letting the poor managers or the managers that didn't measure up against the model go. Yeah, because we all had to get on the same page when we changed out so much, too it was very important that we had a Campbell standard because we recruited people from 150 new senior leaders into the company in a tight window. And they all were speaking different languages. They were from blue chip companies from Procter and Gamble or General Mills or you name it. And uh, they had their own company language they were speaking. We had to have standards for the Campbell way of doing things, what we wanted to do and how we wanted to do it. So it was, it was an important process for sussing out performance and, and evaluating the leadership team we had inherited, but it was also important for getting our rudder in the water with what we expected of the leaders that we brought in. And uh, so it was uh, mission critical, but I had no idea how it was gonna go. I did know uh, that if nothing changes, nothing changes, and our performance needed to change. So we needed to make changes. With all these new people coming in, with letting people go, how did you get everyone on the same page and moving in the right direction? Well, you know, it's, it's, if it was easy, uh, I would have written a book about it uh, called The Energy Bus or something. <laughs> but uh, no, it, it, this is a messy process. You, you have the best of intentions. You try and create as much clarity as you can, but then you just put one foot in front of the other. I, I, I had, a few, I had uh, a few practices that were important in this process. The first practice I have is something I call declaring myself. And uh, the first hour of the first day, I went into the company and the first hour of the first day with every one of my direct reports, I would sit down with them and tell them where I was coming from, exactly what I expected. Uh, so that there was no mistaking my agenda. It would take about an hour. At the end of that hour, I'd say, okay, now you know what I say I expect and how I intend to behave with you. And now you can see if I do it. If I do what I say I'm going to do, I guess you can trust me. If I don't, you'll know you can't, but at least you'll know. My goal here is to be crystal clear about what we're trying to do so that we can just focus on doing it. I've met so many leaders who have spent months working for a new boss who feel like they're on eggshells trying to figure out what does he or she really want. I know what she says. I'm not sure what she means. I, the first hour, first day, I just try and take all the mystery out of the relationship. And I have found it's incredibly helpful because organizations in crisis need clarity. Uh, but they also need some compassion too. And so in that in that 
window when I sit down with organizations and with leaders, I talk about my overarching philosophy, which is about being very tough-minded on standards of performance, because that's what we're there to deliver for all of our stakeholders, but also being very tender-hearted with the people. I don't think it's one or the other. I think it's a blend of both. And uh, you can't ask your organization to care about your agenda as a company until you demonstrate in a very tangible and real way that you care about their agenda as a person. It just, to me, it just doesn't make any sense any other way. So I, I share all that day one, and then I have to actually, I have practices where I actually act on it. A uh, practice that you know well uh, that I've employed is because I'm an introvert. I would write a lot of notes to people so I could think exactly what I wanted to say to them, and, 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 and I would write 10 to 20 notes a day to employees six days a week for 10 years uh, celebrating what was going right. My observation has been in all companies I've worked in that companies are really are critical thinking machines. All of the, all the companies I've worked in, we have a lot of bright people and we're there to solve problems. The deal is, though, that even in the most dysfunctional companies, eight out of 10 things that are being done are being done right, but nobody talks about it. So I, I try and bring some balance, and I would celebrate what was going right while we were being real tough-minded on what wasn't working. So I, I wrote these notes, 10 to 20 a day for a decade. When all was said and done, somebody said, well, how many notes did you write to employees? And we... I didn't know, I never thought about it that way. So we did the math and it was well over 30,000 notes to employees over a decade. We only had 20,000 employees. Everybody had a note. And wherever you went in the world, I don't care if it's in Papua New Guinea or uh, Shanghai or Paris or London, wherever you went in the world, we were, uh, there were my notes stuck to people's cubicles, handwritten, signed by me, delivered as soon as I discovered what they did, uh, saying thank you for the good work. So I was trying to celebrate people and celebrate what, what they were doing right, which was consistent with how I declared myself while we aggressively attacked what wasn't going well. And you also, so, you also spent time in the, in, in the lunchroom, right? Just talking to people where people oh, were yeah. in the dining room. Oh. That was awkward because I am an introvert and uh, I've obviously gotten more comfortable with it over the years, but uh, I am shy. And I went into a new company and I didn't know anybody. I didn't want to go into the lunchroom. I didn't want to walk the halls. I didn't know anybody. And so uh, it took my assistant at the time, a woman by the name of Sally Collins to say, and this didn't fully happen until 2008 after I'd been there for almost eight years. She said, uh, when we had the meltdown in the markets, when 499 stocks in the S and P 500 went down, only one went up. I can't imagine what company that might've been. It might've been a small soup company in Camden, New Jersey. But anyway, when the market <laughs> collapsed, I said, you got to get out and talk to more people. I don't care if you're shy or not. I said, I'm not going out there. I'm, and she said, oh, yes, you are. I'm going to find a half an hour on your schedule every day, even if you don't go to the lunchroom. And I'm going to uh, save a half hour, and you're going to put on your pedometer, you're going to put on your sneakers, and you're going to go out there and walk around. You need to get your 10,000 steps in, and you need to take care of this every day. You need to be more visible. I said, I'm not going. The next day, she had blocked it out. She had my shoes there and my pedometer. She said, here you go. You're going out there. So I went out. She put an article in our, on our uh, portal that said, Doug's going to start walking around the halls. And he's going to have his shoes on. He may not stop to talk because he's going to keep walking around. But he's going to be out there. And so I, I was trapped. I had to go out. I finally did. I found out people weren't that scary. <laughs> and I actually started talking to them. Earlier in my time there, she had me going to the lunchroom to meet with people too, but I did that more in structured situations where I was more comfortable. Ultimately, it took years. I'm a slow learner. I discovered people were okay. They wouldn't bite. And 
and uh, and I could actually go and get out and talk to him. It's, it's embarrassing because I was in my mid fifties when all this was going on, and I'm pretty slow. I was just starting to figure it out. What did you learn from talking to all these different employees? Well, I I learned that they care deeply about being part of a community that had good intentions, had a sense of purpose about it, and uh, that valued them. Uh, I also just got all kinds of great reconnaissance. Uh, a woman that I had worked with who succeeded me as CEO, Denise Morrison, used to have this practice of when she would talk with people, saying what's working, what's not working, and what needs to be done next. I started stealing a page from that book, and I, I would ultimately ask, well, that I, 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 we'd get in conversation, and then I'd say, that's good, but what can we do better? And at first, nobody would, they, they were too, they didn't, weren't comfortable telling me that everything wasn't perfect. But in the fullness of time, they knew I was going to ask, and they started telling me things about, here's what we can do better. And I think in the fullness of time, it created a sense of candor, which I think is mission critical in an organization. Uh, if you can't, you know, I, uh, Jim Collins talks about it, as you know, in Good to Great. He talks about one of his core principles is you, that you have to confront the brutal facts every day. And then in my own little way, I was doing that, but I was modeling a behavior that said it's okay for everybody. So that's what I learned. Yes, yeah, that's, that's amazing. How important is it for a leader like you to get out and connect with their people, with their teams? And what would you say to the leaders that say they're too busy to do that? Uh, well, this is what I do say. You know, um, it is all about the people. If you think about the decisions made in an organization, I don't care how big your group is or whatever, 999 out of 1,000 decisions are being made when you're not in the room. You're not there. And by the time you hear about them, most of them will have been reimagined and explained to you in a way where they make perfect sense, even if they don't. So you are totally, totally dependent on others in the performance of your duties. Totally. You're, if you were, you're not all alone at home just washing dishes here. You're managing an enterprise that is full of connections and ups and downs and sideways things. And you need to have a team that is fully engaged in that work and that can function when you're not in the room because you're never in the room. So it's just not practical to, uh, to sit there and, and in, your, in the confines of your office and think about the tasks and not engage the people uh, in a way that says, I'm with you when you make these decisions, let's get all on the same page and we're all in this together. So I, I just don't think it's practical. You know, there are a few gifted leaders who have been able to do that, but even the most difficult leaders, think about Steve Jobs, he was totally dependent on others. And ultimately, at the end of his career, he was acknowledging that and saying, you know, boy, I sort of missed the boat here. I was really dependent on all these people, and thank God I was on this voyage with them, because as, you know, as important as this voyage what has been to me, uh, it wouldn't be the same if I didn't have this cadre of people around me. Uh, I'm at that stage in my career now where I'm retired from corporate life, but, uh, and I feel the same way. What a blessing it was to be on the journey with all these people. They need to be engaged and sitting in the confines of your offices is, 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 is insufficient, especially as you know, with today's uh, uh, and, uh, associate population, which is five different generations at work, uh, a wonderful mix in gender, a wonderful mix of ethnicity, a wonderful mix of geographies, but all very different places. And you need to be tuned into that 
Petri dish and, and engaged in it if you want to manage it well. To know it, to try and manage it without viscerally understanding it is a high risk proposition. So you said you retired from corporate life, but you're definitely not retired. Can you talk about what you're doing now and, and how do we pronounce your name the right way? I always, I won't, I'm never sure if I said it the right way. Well, uh, it's Conant. Conant, yep, okay. Uh, long O. And uh, what I, I, my observation is that uh, uh, all the leadership conversations that are going on not all of them, most of them, uh, as people are trying to lift their leadership profile and contribute at a higher level, uh, are, being, are being led by people who have a lot to offer, but have never walked a mile in the moccasins of the people they're coaching and teaching. They have a lot to add because they've studied leaders, they've observed them, and they make a big difference. My colleagues at the Kellogg School, where I'm chairman of the Kellogg Executive Leadership Institute, my colleagues uh, that I work with from Harvard Business School, and the, the people I know at Wharton here in Philadelphia, where, where my offices are, they're exceptional teachers, but they have never walked a mile in the shoes of the people they are teaching. Uh, they have a lot to add. What's missing is people like me who have actually walked a mile in those shoes, started at the bottom and at the entry level and worked through all this and had to, have had to live with their decisions for years and, uh, and rationalize them. Yeah. And so what I'm trying to do is offer what I call the practitioner's perspective uh, in terms of leadership that works in the 21st century. It is different but there are some guiding principles that are very much the same. So I'm doing that. I'm teaching. I'm uh, writing a lot. I'm working on a, another book that will be completed in the next year. Uh, and I am uh, just trying to add to the conversation so that it's more well-rounded. That's why I admire you so much. I mean, I write about leadership, but you have lived leadership. You are someone who has put this into practice. Can you talk about your first book, which is a culmination of a lot of your experiences as a leader, and then what are you working on now? Uh, the first book was called Touch Points, and uh, it's about uh, how you can have a powerful impact in the smallest of moments. And uh, basically, my observation would be that people, by and large, uh, uh, are, are getting interrupted all day long. There, you have like you can't just sit in your office and think about what you need to write and spend an hour on uh, not, uh, not interrupted. Uh, and so we're living in the world of interruptions. On average, people are having 400 interactions in a day. They last less than two minutes. And that's how they have to lead their lives. And in my generation, uh, the people that were the leaders looked at all these and, and said, I, I've got to get rid of all these interruptions. I have to close my door and get my work done. What they don't realize is these interruptions are the work today. You have to be highly effective in small moments to get things done. And so we created a perspective that says, here's how you can be highly effective in the smallest of moments. And uh, we call it touch points. And there's a process for managing two-minute interactions that helps you heighten your effectiveness because you don't have a choice. You're going to be, you're going to, I mean, in large organizations, people are getting 200 to 400 emails a day. And then you say, well, do you have meetings? Oh, yeah, we have meetings all the time. Uh, and then you say, would you get interrupted by phone calls? Oh, yeah, the phone rings all the time. Well, do you uh, have somebody standing outside your office when it's lunchtime? saying, I, you haven't gotten back to my email, my text, or my phone call. Maybe we could talk over lunch about this project I'm working on. Are you free? And then you, you get back from lunch and you get a message from Johnny at school saying, I'm not feeling well. Can you come pick me up? I mean, people feel as if they're getting a sip of water from the fire hydrant of life now. And I think the challenge for leaders like you and me is to help them find a way to be more effective in that reality. 
not to try and turn the clock back and create a new reality. And so that's what I'm focusing on now. I think there's some very practical things you can do. Touch points uh, made the New York Times bestseller list. It's been a great platform for me to continue my work since I retired five years ago, six years ago. <laughs> and uh, uh, so that's that book. The new book is called, oh, I can't tell you. If I told you, I'd have to kill you. <laughs> now, a key lesson for me over the last six years is that there is no one formula for leadership. Uh, I've been through phases. I studied all the American presidents in college. I wanted to be like George Washington, and then I wanted to be like Abraham Lincoln, and then I wanted to be Teddy Roosevelt incarnate. Then I started studying world leaders. I said, well, Gandhi's pretty cool. I want to be like Gandhi. And then I said, look at Mother Teresa. She has no resources, and she has more moral authority than anybody on the planet. So you can't tell me it's a resource issue. She's neat, maybe I'll be more like her. I get myself so confused trying to be like Mike, if you will, that I said, wait a minute, I've got to rethink this. And as I've rethought it, I think we all, it's incumbent upon each of us to create our own model for how we want to walk in the world and how we want to lead. And so I'm working on a book now that helps people in a practical way uh, uh, design their own leadership model and and create their own agenda for leading in a way that works for them. Because as you know, uh, the world's going to continue to get crazier and they're going to have to design something that speaks to them. Not you and I can't do that. And so that's, and I, I'm fine. I found a way to create an elegantly simple model uh, for doing something iteratively that allows you to really lift your game in a way that works for you. I've been uh, teaching a boot camp here in Philadelphia for several years now. And as I've been taking people through this work, we've sort of figured out a way to activate it. And so uh, that's what I'm writing about now. That is brilliant. I love that. I agree. <laughs> yeah, <it's brilliant. laughs> it is. No, and I, you know, I often say, with these coaches I work with, for instance, that one coach will leave another coach. They'll try to be like Belichick of the Patriots, and you can't be like Belichick. You have to be your own, your own leader. You talked about studying uh, in college. You talked about studying the leaders that you admired. Can you just briefly talk about your college experience with the Northwestern, right? And, um, yeah. and you, you played tennis. What did you learn from playing tennis college and just be a competitive athlete? And then how did that translate into the – Corporate world. My son is a competitive tennis player. He's going to college to play tennis now, and he loves business. So I think this might be a great uh, learning experience for him among many people. Yeah. Well, uh, uh, first of all, I, 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 one of my best, most read blogs at ConantLeadership.com is Life Lessons from the Game of Tennis. Uh, there, I have 13 life lessons that uh, speak to that very subject about learning how to compete with civility and uh, how to, to perform under pressure all alone in the moment. And I learned a lot of life lessons on how to prepare to perform uh, before you go on the court. So uh, I, uh, in the last five years, I, we, as we got into the social media piece, we discovered mostly people don't want to read my, our books, as, as well written as they are. John. Uh, uh, so we've gone to a blog format that where we're pretty prolific. And, and so uh, 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 at Twitter, Facebook, and so we're publishing these blogs. But one of the best read blogs is this Life Lessons piece. I'll link to it. Yeah, we'll make sure we link to it from, uh, from this conversation. But I went to, when I was at Northwestern, I was recruited there on an athletic scholarship. So it paid my undergraduate education. And then I went straight on to graduate school and uh, as an assistant coach and basically paid for my graduate education and got my MBA by the time I was 24. So it was a huge benefit to me. Uh, while I was in college, I was not the world's greatest student. I was too busy being trying to be the world's greatest tennis player and also working other jobs to kind of support myself. So... Uh, but what I did find interesting uh, 
were life lessons from leaders that I admired. And I was a political science major, so I, I was and a history major at the time. So I was studying American presidents. And then as I got into political science, I started studying world leaders. And then as I went into graduate school, I started, I just found their lives interesting. And they were real lives, you know, I was, they were dealing with real issues and they were making real, this, real decisions. And I just found that fascinating. And then I went into business and I started reading about business leaders and I found them to be absolutely fascinating. So what made my education real for me was studying leaders of all shapes and sizes all the way through. And I also studied tennis players who were role models for me and the kind of routines they would develop, the practice habits they would have, uh, the way they viewed their craft. Uh, so tennis was important and, uh, and the, the role models in tennis were important. And so uh, that's studying the people was what I found uh, most instructive over the course of my undergraduate and graduate career while I learned the disciplines I needed to learn to, to show up at work and be competent. Uh, performing under pressure was probably the biggest single, uh, as you know, uh, you know, you, uh, and as your son knows, you're all alone on a tennis court and the pressure is mounting and everybody's watching and how you handle it sort of defines your success. And so I found when I got into the business world, I was very comfortable being under pressure because I had been there and I knew I'd figure it out. I was with, working with some people that were much smarter than I was, but when the, the lights were on, they sort of weren't as comfortable. And uh, so I found the one thing that worked for me was my ability to, uh, to show up under pressure and, and, engage, and engage in a way that got the job done. And as a tennis player, you have to have vision. And as a leader, you have to have vision. And we have to talk about that because it's one of the greatest lessons I learned from you. You said that as a leader, one of the most important things you did was to share the vision everywhere and anywhere at all the meetings. Can you talk about how important vision is and how you did that? Yeah, I, I, it goes by a lot of words. The language I use today is higher purpose, but uh, it's, it's vision, it's higher purpose, it's a sense of mission, it's a calling, something that transcends the ordinary. What I found in tennis, but I also found it in business is, you know, we're all muddling through life. We all aspire to do something extraordinary. If you think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, you know, and you go to the pinnacle of that triangle, it's self-actualization. Stephen Covey calls it uh, leaving a legacy. Uh, you sort of want to be working on something that transcends the ordinary. You don't want your life to be ordinary. So uh, I sort of, everybody I've worked with this, would, would agree with that statement. And so in tennis, I had to sort through, okay, what do I want to achieve? And what's my aspiration? What's my vision? What's my higher calling here? How good do, how, how do I, and then how do I bring that vision to life? But it all starts with envisioning your future. And uh, you had to do it in tennis. You had to, you had to envision each match, how it was going to unfold and how you wanted to play it. You had to envision your career and how far did you want to go with this and what was the price you were willing to pay to get there. Uh, you know, I often talk, and I wrote another blog about this, all of us have to live in three time zones. Uh, we have to remember and honor the past, leverage and honor the past. We have to perform in the present. And we all feel as if we have to be moving towards a more, more prosperous future. If you leave the future out, you're just muddling around in the past and the present, and you're rudderless. So you've got to lean into this notion of vision, higher purpose, doing something special. It's what makes it all worthwhile. And it, it creates a, a, a sense of what Bill George at Harvard would call true north, right? So that you, you, you've got a place you're going to that's a better place than where you are today. And you're taking your family there, 
you're taking your friends there, you're taking your colleagues there. Uh, to me, that's what it's all about. Did you start each meeting by sharing that vision with, with the folks at Campbell's Hoop? No, because yes and no. Uh, it's funny, as a leader, you, you create this vision. We wanted to build the world's most extraordinary uh, uh, food company by nourishing people's lives everywhere, every day. Campbell's wanted to nourish lives with all of our stakeholders. And you, you feel like once you've talked, you've said that like 50 times, it's done. But what I found is it's not done. It's never done. So, because I may have said it 50 times, but the people I'm speaking with have only heard it once or twice from me. And uh, so I found I needed to be like a broken record with the vision. And it wasn't just me. We had to have it up in the halls. We had to have the other leaders connecting to it. We had to couch every plan we ever did in how we were trying to move things forward. Every time we had recognition events, we we put the recognition pieces in under the rubric of the mission and our core values. So we had to constantly be bringing it to life for people to make it real. Uh, I didn't start every meeting with it, but I started a lot of them with it. So two final questions. What's a, def what's a defining moment in your life, something that made you who you are today or a hardship that you faced that you had to overcome to become the person you are? Well, you know, I'm a work in pro progress every day. So every, you know, my, my, I'm always trying to do a little better tomorrow than I did today. That's been my MO from day one. Uh, and I plan to live to 120. I'm only 67. So I'm a little over halfway. I like that. But, but at any rate, uh, two things I would call out. One is I was fired from a job. 10 years into my career. And uh, I went into work one day, the guy said, your job's been eliminated. You need to pack up and be out of here by noon. I had worked for the company for 10 years. And uh, it was just devastating. I went home to my wife, my two small children, my one very large mortgage, feeling every bit the victim. Uh, that was really hard. I was not prepared for it. I learned from that and it, it changed the course of my life because in that experience, I found myself building a network of people that transcended my normal work network. And some of those people are active people in my life today, 35 years later. So uh, that experience was traumatic, but the network was there and, I, and, and I've helped them and they've been helping me all along the way. So this notion of building a network and and, and, and moving your life forward with this network is a powerful one. The other uh, lesson, uh, the other time I, as you know, I was in a near fatal car accident, July 2nd, 2009, I was asleep in the back seat uh, on the New Jersey Turnpike and uh, we had a horrible accident. I was uh, still CEO of Campbell Soup Company, but I was not in good shape, went through I was still CEO for another two years, but I was in and out of the hospital having operations. I am living proof that you can't put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Though. As long as I keep my sweatshirt on, you'll never know. Uh, but uh, that experience was interesting. It, it just validated for me that, that what I was doing for me had, was on the right track. You know, all, all those notes I talked about writing to employees, well, in the hospital, my wife would be sitting at, I'm going to get choked up. My wife would be sitting at my side, and every day we'd get a pile of notes from employees. Thousands of them. Thousands of employees saying essentially, you know that note you sent me uh, when I did this right in Papua New Guinea? I shared it with my family. I want you to know uh, my family is thinking of you in this hour of need. If I ever get you up to my offices here, you'll see a whole shelf full of notebooks that my wife put together, uh, filled with get well cards from employees. Now, obviously I didn't write them expecting to hear back from them, but you know, I found that they were there for me and we needed it. We were in bad shape. Uh, How bad? 
How bad? Was, was it, how bad was it? Were there thoughts that, I mean, you might not make it after the accident? But, uh, uh, I can say this now. I probably couldn't, I couldn't, didn't really say this to my board. Uh, my initial surgery was almost 18 hours and that was touch and go. Uh, so, uh, and after that, it was just putting me back together again. But, um, uh, so it was, it, you know, six operations in seven years. It's, uh, I am, as I said, I'm living proof. You can put Humpty Dumpty back together again. Are you able to be, are you able to be active now? Are you able to walk in and, um... well, I can, I can, you know, it's sad because I can't play tennis. I can't even run. I can't play golf. I have no core. Uh, I'm just held together with mesh. And uh, uh, when I'm when I'm waking up, uh, I can't. I'm like a turtle on its back. I sort of have to. It takes a while to get prone. But you know, I can get up and get around. And uh, if you follow all that I'm doing, you'll see I'm still uh, as active as anybody could be. You know, accident or no accident. So I'm incredibly blessed. And that's the other lesson I learned, you know, uh, from that accident, I said, if I ever get up and get going again, I'm going to go with my boots on. I have a lot to give to this world and I'm going to give it until I can't give it anymore. And that's what I'm doing now. That, that's why I think you're one of the greatest leaders in the world. So I really appreciate you sharing that. Uh, final question. What are you excited about now? You've done so much, but I know that you're not done yet. So what are you looking forward to? Well, what, what I look forward to is helping young leaders uh, through the terrain, the leadership terrain in a really chaotic time. And, and, and the key that I'm, 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 I'm passionate about is helping them find the leader within. It's all about, it's, it's all in there. We just have, as you know, we have to help them find it. And, and I just love helping leaders uh, find their way. And that's what I do. And it's, uh, I feel sort of like a, a partner and a pathfinder. And there's no more fulfilling work. How can people find out more about what you're doing? If you go to conantleadership.com, uh, it's all there. You follow us on Twitter, Facebook. We're active, very active. And uh, we're just trying to contribute to the conversation. We're not promoting ourselves, really. We're not in this to make money. I don't take a salary. Uh, uh, if we, make, we cover our nominal costs, we sort of run it like Newman's Own. All the profits we make, we give away. And... Uh, uh, and it, it feels good to just be there and ha be helping people. So go to conantleadership.com. Doug Conant, thanks for being a role model for me and so many others. And thanks for making the world a better place with, with your leadership. I really appreciate it. And before you go, I got to say, you were a hit at my conference when, when I had you come speak. You're, you're, you helped give our team the energy we needed to do what we needed to do at that time. Because when you joined us, we were just on the heels of going through the change process and people were getting tired and worn out. And then after an hour with you and a tour around your energy bus, <laughs> we were flying high and ready to go. You did good work. And that's partially why I'm talking to you here today. Oh, that means a lot. That means well done. That means a lot. I think back then it was like 2008. I didn't really even know much back then about leadership. I was learning. Oh, no. You, you, have, you have plenty in the tank. Well, I appreciate that. That means, that means the world to me.